Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we have an incredibly special guest, Miss Patricia Tallman. She was an actor and a stunt double in many episodes, as well as apparently aliens or some kind of crazy makeup we just found out in Next Generation, in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, in Voyager. She's also in many episodes of Babylon 5. I could go on and on, but instead, let's hear it from her. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> Got it. You're welcome. So, first things first, I guess maybe you started chronologically mm. with Star Trek. How'd you first get into your first job at Star Trek? Yeah, so I was, uh, I was new to Los Angeles, and... Um, I, I was lucky because I had an agent, so I had the acting thing starting up, but I was looking for my bread and butter work, which is stunt work. And um, I, I had some stunt folks who I had met that were taking me around, and I got introduced to Dennis Madalone, who was the stunt coordinator on Next Generation. And um, I was a good size to double a lot of the guest stars. Um, so he tried me out. That's how stunt folks do it. They kind of give you a chance to prove yourself. And um, he, he liked what he, my work ethic, I guess, and, and uh, started to give me more to do. I was a really good double for Gates. Gates didn't have a whole lot of major stunts going on, but <laughs> you know, there's a lot of what they call ND stunts or nondescript. So it'd be mm -hmm. your random red shirt kind of thing, you know? Um, and uh, I was really, really lucky. I just, I just was so lucky by the, by the end of my run at Paramount, I had done over 50 episodes of the various Star Treks. I had a uniform in every color and wardrobe. Just wow. ready to go, and I doubled. I doubled guest star after guest star. Um, I was just so blessed. And when Deep Space Nine started up, uh, and Nana was cast as first, they were talking about Michelle Forbes playing that role. They were going to carry her character over from um, Next Generation, and I was her stunt double. So I was like, Ah, great, I'm in. But then Michelle decided not to do it, and uh, luckily they hired Nana, who was even better fit for me. Our hair was exactly the same. I had short red hair and we were able to, uh, I was just able to flow right into that. So, I, you know, I've been just blessed, really blessed. Yeah. Michelle Forbes, for those who don't know, uh, that is Ensign Rowe, later uh, Lieutenant Rowe. And they kind of modeled the character of Major Kira. I, not just modeled, but I believe, like you said, they were going to have her as a character, but she didn't. So then instead they got Nana Visitor, changed it to Major Kira, and the rest is history. The rest is history. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was it's so it's so interesting when you're um, when you're watching events unfold, you know, in real time on the set, just watching these things happen, go, whoa, what's happening now? And Voyager, um, when we started on Voyager, uh, and I say we being part of the stunt team. So we're kind of, you know, excited about getting another new show going. And we had jean vier Bujold as, as the captain. Mm -hmm. And I am a big fan of her work from way back, but she was not comfortable. It was, they, she had a tough time. Uh, it, it's hard work doing it's hard, it's hard work playing spaceman too. And then like, you're playing space person and you have, <laughs> you're coming in with that, with this massive fan base and this, you know, this Bible that you need to follow of, of Trek history. So it was just not a, a happy fit for her. So then they were scrambling to, to find, luckily they found Kate Mulgrew. And again, you know, history is made. It all works out the way it's supposed to. But um, it, watching that in real time is, is pretty, Amazing. It's amazing. So you, you worked alongside the first the first hire for Captain Janeway, is, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who is a very famous French actress and and yeah. and <clears throat> wonderful, you know, just just but it is it does take a particular stamina, fortitude, willingness. You know, Patrick Stewart stepping in to as Jean-Luc, um, it's kind of phenomenal because, I mean, he was coming from a background as well that that 
very different kind of work is involved right. in, a, in an episodic plus the hard work that goes into a Star Trek show. So, yeah. Do you remember, uh, you did have a couple credits uh, doing stunts in Voyager anyway. Uh, yeah. Do you remember what they were and what you were doing specifically? I believe it was for guest stars. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think I'd ever doubled an actor on that show. Uh, um, I mean, a regular actor, actress. I did a, I did something called Favorite Son. And the reason I remember that was because I got to beat up Garrett Wong with a with a stick and he was really pissed off <laughs> because he's like, are you kidding me? We have our hairs all down and gorgeous and we're wearing these gowns, you know? So he's getting beat up by very feminine women. And he just was like, seriously, really guys? <laughs> it's kind of funny. And then I, think I doubled he liked it more than he let on. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure he liked it a lot more than he let on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. I, I he, he, he's been a, a good friend ever since. So I, I feel like I didn't do him too much of a disservice. Uh, and then I doubled Marjorie Monahan in a, I can't remember the name of the episode, but she was like this Viking woman hmm. in the holodeck. I don't know. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking it up. It says it was in the episode Heroes and Demons. That's it. So everybody at home, check out uh, Heroes and Demons. They probably know exactly the episode we're talking I know. about. I'm sure and we're like, do. what episode was what that? Was that? But you they know, know when it. You're doing it when we're working. Like there's there's probably another 10 or 12 episodes of Voyager. I don't remember what I was doing. And we're not credited for it because we're doubling somebody else. Or you're just in the background. Like I come on and be safety with somebody else. Um, but they, when you're working on the episode, it's you're not as uh, aware of the title of the episode. You're 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 inside of a series of events that all blend together that turn out to be season one or season mm -hmm. two. You know what I mean? So each individual individual episode, the names just kind of don't have meaning yet. It takes kind of history yeah. and talking about it, like we're doing now when it starts to stick. Now you brought up uh, Dennis Madalone, and I've I've pointed him out many times to Ryan when we're watching episodes, and I say, "Hey, that's that's Dennis Madalone, that's Dennis. <laughs> the dude who paid homage to his dog." Oh, yeah, that's how I remember him. Dog, yeah, yeah, he used to wear. Actually, it's funny. I'm wearing this handkerchief because he actually would always wear a handkerchief right. tied tied around his uh, his leg, um, and I believe his dog's name is Danger. But um, cute. Was was Dennis Madalone the person that like talked you into getting into the stunt business? Oh to no, begin I, with? right? Uh, no, I, no, I'd been a stunt woman for a while, um, but I was new to Los Angeles. I started in New York. Yeah. Okay. And what what made you decide to go that route? Because that's not like a, a I know. usual. It, 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 I really did fall into it, but um, boom. I, <laughs> but I I, I was have been an actress since I was fifteen years old, um, and getting paid for it and kind of going towards the theater. So that's why I ended up in, in New York. And um, I was in a period sword technique class in New York City, just because I'm a nerd and met some stunt people in there. Then one time, one of them was, who was the stunt coordinator said, you know, I need an actress who's five foot nine with red hair to fall down some stairs. Would you do it? And I was like, okay, I had no idea what this meant. <laughs> never even thought about a stunt career or what stunt people did it was not on my radar yeah. and i i uh i rehearsed with them um i did the job it was on a soap opera i had to fall of course the woman's wearing lingerie so you're falling downstairs in lingerie and i had to do that a few times uh and they paid me 1200 bucks which was a fortune for me which is days. why people that do stunts they go well maybe i will do another stunt then maybe i'll do this <laughs> working part-time in the little girls department in Macy's, you know, so mm. I, I, I maybe made a thousand dollars in a month. So to make 1200 for a day's work, yeah, I'm bruised, but, and it goes towards my union, my pension and my health. Are you kidding? So, right. um, I just started to apprentice with some people and to see if I could really do this thing. And it turned out I could mm. crazy. Like Nana, I had a dance background. So, um, that helped with choreography like for fights. Yeah. Exactly. And I loved fencing. I fenced in college and I just kept stage combat going. And yeah, it all kind of dovetailed, but I didn't plan it. I had no idea. Wow. 
it was going to go that way. Yeah. And I kept my acting career going. That's what I wanted to be. Now, this is a question yeah. you may have been asked a few times, but not by us. Uh, <laughs> what was the most difficult uh, stunt you had to do in Star Trek? Whether it was oh. difficult physically to do or because there was actual in injury potential or legitimate potential for injury? Uh, was there something that kind of stands out as kind of the most difficult one? We we had some challenging, you know, the stunts on Star Trek are really, you're kind of throwing yourself around because you're faking an impact of some right. sort, you know. Um, but we, we uh, Deep Space Nine got a chance to develop fights with some weaponry, you know, and developing the Klingon weaponry and... Um, how that fighting style would look, making sense out of that. That was a, that was a, a lot of fun and a challenge, but a, a fun challenge. Um, and one time we designed these fights that, uh, that Dax, Terry Farrell's character, who I, who I was her double, um, was going to be in, in extensively. It was that whole storyline with her and Worf. Mm -hmm. And she was having to learn how to do this fight or proficient at this fight. And, um, one of my, we just tried, we were doing our best to kind of create this fighting style. Then we got on the set, Terry, we're ready to shoot. And they always put the stunts to the, the end of the day. I don't know why that is. <laughs> so we're, cool. All right, now it's hurry up and go. We have 20 minutes to shoot this entire time. Maybe because stunt stunts can take, stunts can really take a long time sometimes because so many things can go wrong. I'm just guessing. And so they mm. want to just knock out all the dialogue really quickly and then say, all right, do Here your we worst. Are. Now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we had like no yeah. time to do this whole big fight sequence. And Terry wanted to do it the other way around. She wanted to switch the hands the way that the hands were. It mm. just was more comfortable for her. <clears throat> so fair enough. You know, this is her character. But I had learned it the whole other way and all the guys were fighting me in a particular way. So we had to flip it and we had like 10 minutes to completely change the fight. That was nerve wracking as hell um, because you want it to look good and you're selling this whole new weapon. You're selling, you know, it's a big deal to, to, uh, to pull something like that off. I had to do. Um, <laughs> I just remind me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I would have said Terry. We're doing it like this. Hold the damn thing this way, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Practice it like this. You, you don't want to go up against Terry. I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually, she probably would have been cool about it if you explained it. Oh, no, we tried. Her. We tried to talk to her about it. Dennis was really, he's really great. He's very diplomatic. We tried it. She yeah. was insistent. She's like, no, I, I can't sell that. I can't do that. That's, you know, my... She wanted to do it. Yeah, makes sense. She wanted to do it. Yeah. That, it made sense. She wanted to be more confident, you know, right. and, and she needs to look badass. So mm -hmm. it's important. Right. Um, I, I, on Deep Space Nine, we were doing a, a sequence in a cave. And again, I'm not going to remember the episode. Sorry about that. I'm doubling the gnaw at this point. And, um, and we had to like shimmy along the side of a cave. And then there's an earthquake. And the gnaw's character almost falls off, you know, and perishes. So we're, they're trying very hard for her not to fall. And um, they had me slip and fall and be able to grab at the last. And uh, then they pull me back up. And this is all as ma major Kira. Um, but the, the cable broke and the cable that was supposed to hold me. So I uh -oh. fell and that was okay. We had safety. We were rigged for safety. And um, the, the stunt man who was my safety guy hit my legs out from under me. So I would land flat on my back, just flat. And they had some boxes on the ground so that I, and I wasn't hurt. The wind was knocked out of me. I was it. Um, nice. So you have a spotter down below to where yeah. if you fall, kind of like uh, when, the, when uh, gymnasts have a spotter, when you're practicing doing the flips to make yeah. sure you land on your feet. They do this to make sure you land flat on your back on the mat. Yeah, the in this oh, that's case, cool. yeah, in this case, because to land to land on your feet, you're going to jar your spine. And this mm -hmm. actually happened to a stunt woman friend of mine who who landed on her feet and um, severed her spine, and she was a quadriplegic after that until she died. Gee. Yeah, so it's very dangerous to land anyway. You know, anyway, mm -hmm. it, it all right. worked out great. Uh, but the the next um, the next week I had a stunt on a movie and I was on um, 
I was on a tower down in, um, not San Pedro, but down there, southern Los Angeles area. And the tower is 320 feet in the air. And they were wiring me and wanting me to fake a fall. Exactly the same thing as on Deep Space Night. And I went, you know, I not only want two wires, I want three yeah. as safety. They put and three a 325 wires. foot human standing below me. <laughs> <laughs> I want, I want the god Shiva standing there with his hands like this. Yes, and sure enough, one of the cables broke. I did the stunt, slip, Aye. fell, grab. One of the cables broke, so I had two safety on. But it was only because I only even thought of that because of Deep Space Nine. So maybe Deep Space Nine saved my life. Wow. Okay, the moment that cable breaks, what goes through your head? Uh, I am I am so fight or flight. You know, I am so adrenalized at that point. I hate heights anyway. 320 feet, holy smokes. I was so focused on you know, holding on to what I had to hold on to. I, it, it just, it wasn't until we were in the elevator going down that I started to shake. Mm. You know, in the ele- back in the elevator, all on hit, going back down to the ground. I was just like, <sighs> how do you overcome those moments? Like, like oh. your fear of heights and then jumping off of the edge of the building. Some, you know, I just do it as fast as I can. When they say action, I'm, pew, you know, I don't want to stand there thinking about it. I, mm-hmm. I had to jump into off a cliff into a, the Rogue River in Oregon. And uh, it, it was on a Rucker Hauer movie. I was doubling Mimi Rogers. And the stunt coordinator, it, I mean, it was the, because I had to climb up the cliff. We, didn't, we couldn't start from the top. I had to do this nor- this rock climb all the way. I hate heights. I'm like sobbing into the <laughs> side of the cliff, going, <laughs> you know, just, trying to be all brave. And then they said, action. And I'm off that rock really fast. So that the uh, director of photography, the DP, said later, you know, at, at dinner, he goes, wow, you were so brave. You were right on. I thought we were going to have to wait for you to gather your courage to jump on. I said, like, yeah, I'm not fucking sitting up there. I'm getting out of here. You know, I want to get down. I don't care if it's a rushing river. It's fine. Anything. Yeah, it's tough. I had to do a, uh, a stunt where I'm running along um, a drawbridge and the drawbridge is going up. And you could, it was one of those graded bridges so that you could see the water below. It was at night and they lit the water. It was just this vertigo nightmare. Mm. And my knees, I couldn't lock my knees. I had to, I was supposed to be running, you know, like full tilt boogie to get to the jump to get to the other side of this drawbridge. And my, I couldn't make my legs work. I was just like rubber bands. I, that was, I'll never forget that because I, I really couldn't make them work any better and they're like pat pat you gotta move a little faster (laughs) (laughs) now speaking of never forget when uh when i first looked you up uh, a couple weeks ago i saw something on your imdb profile that i thought was easily the most memorable thing you've done in my mind that i can picture it every day of my life and i feel like every star trek fan out there when I say this scene, they're going to say, oh, that was you. And I hope I'm right. But it okay. says in the movie, Star Trek Generations, it says that you have a, uh, a credit as Beverly Crusher's waterfall double. And I'm like, is this the infamous scene where Data gives her a push as a joke? and that fall is that fall you that fall is me yes. it is me i i love that so much i got to wear that uniform are you yeah. kidding me oh my god i love the british navy so wearing that british naval costume was just a high and I, a little fun fact behind the scenes i was pregnant um <laughs> I had found out recently that I was pregnant. I was like, oh, my God, I so badly wanted to be on that movie. The, um, when, you, when you shoot movies in a TV series, you have a completely different stunt coordinator. You guys probably know this, but maybe the fans don't. So it's a completely different production company other than Paramount's The Umbrella Owner. And so um, 
I, we, it didn't mean I, I didn't have a job. I didn't know who the stunt coordinator was going to be. They hire their own people, blah, blah, blah. Turns out they hired the stunt coordinator who is a massive uh, fan of mine and brought me on on everything. He, he just gave me so much work. So he said, Patty, you're, you're, uh, you know, everybody on this show. So I, I really want you to be on it. I'll twist my arm. You know, I'm there. I'm so excited. So I got to double Bator, one of the Klingon sisters. I was on the bridge as a red shirt. And um, I, and I doubled Gates, um, but when they measured me, I, I didn't I didn't know I was pregnant yet. And uh, I was actually working with Tommy Lee Jones, and so, and I realized I was pregnant. And then I went back to the set. Um, uh, that that was the easiest part. Falling in the water was not a big deal. I'm a scuba diver. I'm not afraid of water, and I'm wearing a wetsuit under that costume, so I was pretty comfortable. But the, I had to get smashed in the face uh, by Malcolm McDowell <laughs> as the tour and they wanted and they, they were first thinking that they were going to have me like go ass over teacups over this console you know and i would take this big fall and it's kind of like mm. what's ass over teacups that's it's a um a, like a big flip backwards so your ass is going <laughs> over your head and they call it ass over teacups i really don't know why okay so I, I kind of thought, oh, that's going to be a problem. And at the la just before I was going to have to tell Bud, because I told anybody that I was pregnant, I'd be off that set. Because mm -hmm. there's sure. insurance reasons they can't have a pregnant woman on the set. So, um, uh, but they canceled it. They, he said, we don't have time to do this whole thing. So we're just going to have you take the hit and fall back. And I was like, okay, I can do that. That's fine. <laughs> right. But getting into the Klingon sister's costume, because it's leather. So there's no give. And when I went in for the fitting, like I said, I wasn't pregnant. And the the costume designer was, um, uh, he called the, you know, those bust pads, cookies, the bust, you know, because I, cookies? I, I, <laughs> cookies, the cookies, it's called, put in more cookies, because I wasn't, as, put in more cookies. <laughs> I wasn't Klingon sister busty worthy. Let's just say that. So I needed three sets of falsies to get my breasts even close to what. <laughs> what uh, Barbara Marsh or Gwyneth's yeah, breasts it's a, it's were a, really It's a doing? three snickerdoodle outfit. Absolutely. But when <laughs> I came in, you know, whatever it was, two months later to actually do that scene, they were like, oh, my God, rip off the cookies. Patricia, what have you been eating? What's <laughs> going on with this? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't eat the cookies anymore. I didn't you eat developed the your own cookies. I had my own cookies. <laughs> There's a milk and cookies oh, joke. There. So I know. Let's not even go there. Yeah. Let's leave it alone. Let's leave it alone. <laughs> uh, so, so um, doing the the up over flip backwards could have put your your pregnancy at risk, right? Well, I was concerned that it would, and I would have said something at that point because it's you know, um, yeah, I would have said something, but I, I didn't. I didn't need to. And then the only other fall I had. Oh, look, another fun fact. I was. Uh, yeah, I, you can blame me for the crash of the Enterprise. The, our stunt coordinator, coordinator went down to Las Vegas to shoot the, uh, the culminating scene be between Shatner and um, Patrick Stewart. And yeah. so he put me in charge of the set the day we crashed the Enterprise. Uh, I, was, I was on the bridge as a red shirt rolling around on the floor I, while we were firing on the Klingon ship. And I was Bator on the Klingon ship firing on the Enterprise. <laughs> The only person so you that shot can yourself. That. I was that's right. I was destroying myself. Exactly. Yeah, oh, wow. that was that was remarkable. I I didn't quite realize that because we didn't I didn't have the script until you know until the end of the and then they said, Okay, now you're a stunt coordinator and I get the script. It's like, oh I get to know what's going on. Nice. <laughs> it was great. Nice. Yeah. So, so uh, um do, go, oh, go go ahead, no, I was gonna ask you about wearing full makeup and, and uniforms and if and you know, I'm sure that's got to inhibit your abilities. Mm. Yeah. So uh, it, that's why stunt people are supposed to be super skinny because we always have layers on underneath the costume. Like I had to wear a wetsuit mm -hmm. as Gates. Well, Gates mm -hmm. is already really trim and slim. So I can't look bigger than her suddenly, you know, so it's it was it's a challenge. Um, do you mean specifically with the pregnancy or just in general? No, just in general, because yeah. I imagine you're wearing prosthetics and you yeah. have all this stuff that inhibits your, your sight line, your That's ability right. to look around. That's right. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when we have a chance on, on, um, on the Star Trek shows, because Madeline uh, developed these relationships, he would work with 
he'd get the script in advance and he'd work with wardrobe and say, look, we're going to have stunts with this character. So we need, you know, we need to be able to put pads on Pat, for instance. And so we're going to need arms and legs covered or talking to Michael Westmore. But there's not much you can do if you're an established character. If you're a Klingon, you're a Klingon. You have to have that makeup on. But if it's a new character and it maybe is like I was on a, an episode called Starship Mine and um, they were, we were a ragtag bunch of aliens. One of my favorite Next Generation episodes. Well, one of mine you know. too, because I got to follow around Patrick Stewart. I have a phaser on him for the most of the episode and he's wearing tights and he's got- That was, you were one of the, you were one of the four um, baddies, huh? I, yeah. Along I, with I, Mr. Tim Russ, by the way. I know, Tim and I worked together a whole bunch of times. He actually punched me in the face. In the, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he shouldn't have punched me, but he, he's awesome. I love him. He's a great guy. Uh, yeah, that I had, I was so excited to have more of a role as opposed to doubling somebody else. Um, and Michael Westmore's like, oh, Pat, I'm going to make you this great alien. It's going to be so oh, awesome. So and the, cool. hair, the hair lady's like, oh, Pat, we're going to give you this greatest. You're going to look so awesome. And I show up and basically he puts a clitoris on my fa face right here. And she teases my hair out like Bozo. So I'm Bozo with a vagina on my face. That was my alien. And your name was Kiros? Kiros. Kiros. Yeah. That was a really yeah. cool role, though. Really great episode. I mean, sorry about the makeup. But, <laughs> Look but the rest was exactly awesome. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was fun. It was fun. And wow, Patrick Stewart does wow. have a great little butt. It was so fun. <laughs> I think Ryan thinks so too. So you guys can agree on that. No, I know so. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Everybody knows Cheers. it. Cheers. <laughs> uh, let's uh, change the channel for a second here. Otherwise, we can just nerd out about Star Trek forever. And let's nerd out about Babylon 5. You are also in, a, uh, in an amount of Babylon 5 episodes, which is a number that always shows up in Star Trek, 47. That is like the magic Star Trek number, but you're in 47 Babylon 5 episodes. I don't think I even That's knew that. amazing. Neither did I until I cheated. I was in more Star Trek <laughs> than I was Babylon 5. That's funny. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah. That's hilarious. They uh, were our arch nemesis for a while. I, I know. Did. I know. Yeah, for DS9 at least. I don't know about the rest yeah. of the guys, but... Yeah, we deep space that. Yeah, we had. Oh, and it's so funny because that, like I said, I was there in the genesis of all of that, and I'm on both shows. Yeah, kind of just kind of being quiet, not talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I never. If we had a known. Own. I know. If we had a known, Pat. You know, I have to say, <laughs> and, I, and you're going to know who I'm talking about. Um, a producer. You don't have to say his name, but a producer who's actually a pretty cool guy who rode a bike everywhere, and you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah I do. Okay. So I'm I'm in full Dax regalia, you know, and I'm, I'm ready yeah. to do my Dax thing. But I'm at craft service having a cup of coffee because that's all I can eat because I have to stay so skinny for these actresses. And uh, this producer kind of he parks his bike. I see him. I'm kind of doing my thing, not paying attention. He kind of looks around and he gets a little closer. I thought, what's going on? And he goes. I love you on Babylon 5. And he disappears. <laughs> and I'm like, how did he even know that it was me? I mean, I'm not, how did he even know? You know, it was wild. Wow. I still to this day don't know how he knew. It's crazy. He got, he, well, he, he was, he got the intelligence report. He's, he did. He got the, the he, lowdown. I never told yeah. my producers over at Babylon 5 what I was doing. Never. There were t things I couldn't show up for, like some screenings they had, special parties they had, because I was working on Deep Space Nine and we would work 18 hours a day, you yeah. know, until that whole, yeah. I so, love that you was, just mentioned yeah. a producer that rode his bike everywhere and, and Strzok's like, I got oh, you. Got it. I know yeah. who that is. <laughs> There's a bike riding yeah. producer that was very clearly a bike rider. <laughs> well, because only so many producers actually went from the production office to the set. Mm -hmm. It's, you know. Mm -hmm. And hung out. I mean, he, he was a really yeah. nice guy, too. He wasn't one of those stuffed suits that were like dread. Yeah. He was yeah, a decent person. So many. Yeah. yeah. But there wasn't, there wasn't any conflict of interest, like scheduling wise, except for just like event uh, screenings. There weren't days where they said, hey, we need you to work tomorrow on Babylon 5. And you're like, I'm already working on DS9. Right, right. 
I, I don't remember anything in particular that was too stiff. You know, um, Matt alone knew what was going on with me, but he's like the only one. And yeah, I think that I, would, I was cognizant enough of what was super problem that I would, um, I would let Matt alone know. Oh, I'm really, I'm sure I'm going to be working that day. But I don't really, I, I think I just lucked out. I also had a, had an infant son. So, you know, I was talking about being mm -hmm. pregnant during generations. So I did have, Jonathan Frakes had his, they had their, he and Jeannie had their baby and I gave birth to mine right in the same month. Um, yeah, but I think I was just so sleep deprived. I don't remember it. <laughs> I just kept moving. Mm. I just kept moving. That's why I wrote a book, you guys. So I wrote a book about that five year period while I was yeah. on Babylon five. And it was really special to be able to do that um, because I had to, I went back through all my call sheets for Babylon 5 and Star Trek. I was trying wow. to remember what I was doing when and uh, all the shows I, I, I did in between. Like after I did the pilot of Babylon 5 and before I got on the series, I did Jurassic Park. I did Forrest Gump. You know, I did some of the biggest movies I've ever done ever. And and then started back. You know, it's, it's just a time. I, I It was a blur. But to go back through it, and write about it. It's like, oh wow! Yeah. What's the book called? Pleasure Thresholds. And where can we find it? There, uh, I have a store on um, my website b5events.com. Got it. And we'll there's a store that there. In the description box. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so you. So everybody, awesome. that makes an excellent holiday gift for the uh, biggest B5 nerd in your household, or <laughs> even just somebody that's interested in that kind of stuff. Yeah. By the way, this is something I've been wanting to ask you. Sure. Let's get down to the dirt of it. Yeah. Did, did you overhear anybody at the Babylon 5 set talking shit about Deep Space Nine? Like, ah, oh, oh, that God. they totally copied us. Well, who's who do they think they are? All Let's hear the it. Time. We're ready for the dirt. Really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's so, cool. <laughs> so do you guys know this? I'm sure you do. So Joe Straczynski, who wrote, who wrote Babylon 5, right? He created a, a Bible for Babylon 5. And he went to Paramount. So this big Bible, he walks in, here's my five-year series. And they're like, first of all, that's never been done. That's weird. But all right, we'll take a look at it, you know. And then uh, it, they had it for a year. And then they gave it back to him and said, nah, we're going to pass. And then they came out with Deep Space Nine. There's characters with the same names. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that they didn't even bother changing. Completely different show. Obviously, our shows are so different. But... Yeah, that was a that was a, a bone of contention, and then he and Majel, Joe and Majel, just kind of made kissed and made up. They figured it out mm. somehow, but it was a it was a thing, you know. And I oh. definitely heard about it. I was definitely yeah. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't just on our end. I guess the shit talking was uh, two ways. Shit talking right because you're you know you're <laughs> you're we're scrambling for to get it, our show. See the differences uh, 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 on the Paramount lot. I belong to the gym. I knew all the security guards. We you know, the Paramount lots like amazing <laughs> and fun, and and your shows are beautiful. The the, the sets are gorgeous. It, it, we go Babylon Five. I don't know if you would ever been over to those those studios. They were they weren't studios. They were warehouses. Next to a recycling dump, we had <laughs> our our, um, our craft service our, and lunch were intense, rain or shine, all year round, out in the parking lot, which was right next to the recycling dump. I, I had no problem saying skinny. It was the smell from that, you know. <laughs> and the, the sets were such that we, we any airplane flies overhead or a truck oh, no. sh downshifts going into Sunland, you know. We had to stop <laughs> and just wait for the sound to clear. Um, yeah. Going and, into and it, Sunland, where did you? Where were you shooting? Right off the five. Is it's not uh, Laurel Canyon stages, is it? No, it's right no, in that no. Area. Okay. No. But it's right in that area. Okay. Right. They weren't called anything. It still said Aquatech on the outside and Orange Bang on the building. <laughs> we never changed it. Yeah, it's very strange. It's really, and everything is like held together with duct tape and you, you were using, uh, you know, recycled uh, Kleenex boxes and, and egg cartons on <laughs> spray painted silver. There's our set, you know, <laughs> we couldn't touch anything. So to go from that and then to go to Paramount was like, oh my God. Yeah. So mm. funny. 
Yeah. Wow. We had no overtime, not once in five seasons, not once. No forced calls. Wow. Ever. We had no money. They couldn't do it. It was like, okay, cut. That's it. That's a wrap. We're like, <gasps> that's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. You don't get it in that one take. You got to move it. on. <laughs> So those are eight hour work days? Well, 10. Yeah. Yeah. 10, 10 hours. Yeah. Wow. Plus, oh, plus an hour of lunch, you know? Yeah. Because you're on a week contract. So yeah. 10. Not DS9. DS9 did not. 18 hours. <laughs> I, <laughs> not uncommon to be there for 18 yeah. hours. Yeah. And then they finally stopped that because that crew guy died, right? Driving the crew home. guy died. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Happened on our, on our set, I on think. Your on your set. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we were all talking about it. I mean, we're, you know, we were doing the same thing. A lot of stunt people live far out. They're not living in town. They live like out. So people were, it's not uncommon to have an hour commute each way. And when you're driving home and then getting up and driving in, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, that particular day that he passed away, but it was like a 20 hour, 22 hour work day for us. Wow. And I think he lived in Palmdale or something like that. And it was like. Quite a hike. Not uncommon. Yeah. I mean, it was hard for me to make it five minutes down my house to West Hollywood <laughs> from Paramount. So I can only imagine driving an hour. Right. Yeah. Right. And then not getting the turnaround. So driving an hour both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The turnaround meaning is for the for your for you guys. Um it, it's the time you actually get home and, and the time you have to be back. And the crew, of course, last off, first on. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So uh, also, I do want to make sure that we mention, uh, we've still got a few minutes left, but you, speaking of Star Trek and Deep Space Nine, because we have been for the last half hour, but speaking of which, uh, you're working with one of our favorite people in the whole world. Pretty oh. soon you're doing something with Mr. Armin Shimmerman. Yes. Can you tell us about that? I would love to. Um, real real quick, I mean, uh, I've been... Um, I started my uh, my own travel business called Quester Treats Adventures for Nerds. So <laughs> I, I just set up nice. adventures that uh, nerds like us would love. And maybe you're a Harry Potter nerd. And so I had one in England and London. And I had a Lord of the Rings one in the New Zealand, right? So um, I, ha- I have I this, this finally, f- I've been doing this for about five years, finally getting somewhere. What happens? Pandemic hits. Mm. So I had to pivot really fast and I started putting, I merely miss conventions. I love meeting people and doing stuff all over the world. So I started putting up online where we could have, like we had um, Nana and Siddig on and they, we nerd out with them for an hour and then have them talk about something that's meaningful to them. And they talked about Nana's experience at gunpoint Sorak, you probably know about this. And, I remember uh, when this panel happened. It was just maybe a month ago. Or yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So she talked about trauma and recovering from trauma. <clears throat> and Sid's got Sid City, and which is all about helping people deal with their issues. So um, that's what I want to bring to the table. Is not only do we get to nerd out, but then we get to talk about something meaningful. So I had Tim Russ on. Um, we talked about astronomy and Armin is coming on on Saturday. So of course we'll nerd out with Armin and then we're going to talk about Shakespeare because he is a professor of theater. So we're Shakespeare is a passion of his and we're going to, we're going to dive into that beautiful language of love, the hilarious curses, the, you know, demystifying it to the point where you could really enjoy listening to and reading Shakespeare. So that's what we're doing. And you'll be able to get the replay at b5.com, b5events.com. It's such a great really idea. Cool. Yeah, so that's, that's, I just thought it, we got to st- community is really important. And we don't have that in the same way right now. And um, it, it affects a lot mm-hmm. of people. It's hard on people. So I'm trying to find a way to keep reaching out and making that happen. And yet, you know, the exchange of energy, I'm, it, it does, I do charge a ticket price, you know, I'm paying my actors. I want, I want that exchange of energy. So they put out then their hearts to you to, to give you what you need, answer your questions and let you feel seen. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm doing. We'll see Mm. how it goes. And I can't wait for the world to open back up. But meanwhile, I I really appreciate everybody being safe and taking care of each other. Yeah. It's really important. You know, and Armin really gives out 
his energy, as Sirot can attest. He's been so good to our show. He's been so good to the fans and his fans. And he loves to talk about Shakespeare. He loves to tell his stories on Deep Space Nine. I mean, not there's it's just never enough can be said about what a great uh, person he is. He is amazing. And you're gonna have you're gonna have him on your show, right? Maybe. Possibly. <laughs> well, he's been on our show on, you know. a few times. Yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, delicious. he'll he'll be back for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Um <clears throat> Yeah, so that that's 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 it. That's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to to uh, so reinvent D5, ourselves. Yeah, this D five events came as a result of the lockdowns and that's dealing right. with this pandemic. Is that right? That's right. You know, it's a uh, being able to travel and do the conventions are a, a big source of a lot of um, science fiction actors' income, and it's important. And mean, and then they're there and they're put, they're giving the fans uh, all that love and. Um, it's just a conventions are a wonderful experience all around. Um, but if we can't do that, then what do we do? Like, how do we fulfill that for each other? And that's kind of what I'm trying. I'm not trying to be an online convention, but I am trying to be a, a community and a place where we're sharing ideas about, um, personal development and, you know, thriving in difficult times. And if you're struggling with something, you've got community here. Let's reach out. Let's talk about it. You know help you get on your feet hmm. uh, I have a question though this this might sound strange but I'm gonna Perfect. Shoot for it bring anyway. it <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Tim Russ you said Armin's coming on you you did an episode with Nana and I I just find it a little this is my question yes uh, has your relationship with the Star Trek actors been closer than the ones that you had with your your Babylon 5 crew? Aww. Boy, old rivalries die hard with Sarag. Look at this guy. He's yeah, like, I just, I you like it. us better, right? You like right? us better. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, just asking. Just sure. You know, there's a special connection when you're uh, somebody's stunt double over some years, you know. Right. If, if, you're, if you're with somebody as special as Nana, and through Nana, I've met Sid, obviously. Um, and I, I, like I said, I mean, I feel so blessed. But it's my B5 family, the ones, those of us that, are, that have kind of like Bill Mumy, uh, Peter Jurisic, Claudia Christian, Mira Ferland, we're very tight. We constantly text each other. You know, we're pretty, pretty tight. And we, wow. we love our, our family, but... Um, most of that, I, I, I don't know, but how is your experience when you do conventions? Don't you find you have more time to kind of hang out with in a relaxed way with your actor sisters yeah. and brothers? It's like, it's a very different yeah. experience, right? So my, I feel like my connection to everybody has grown during conventions. During conventions. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, wanna... because you get that downtime, you, you, you work together, but then you also get that downtime. You're in a, you're in a strange city or you're in a, foreign place so yeah. you kind of experience that together and you know you're having drinks or coffee or whatever and you get to really uh have a social moment more so than you do in, a, in the working environment on exactly. set when you know they're lighting and they need you and you have to rush around here to there and you're trying to be focused i mean as a professional you want to be there right. plus i don't i didn't have scenes i didn't have a lot of scenes with peter jurisic for instance so i have one scene in five years with him you know um but in doing conventions, uh, hanging out, we just, oh, my God, what a great guy. And then same, it just, you, you hear each other tell stories, and you, you take that in completely differently. Oh, I didn't know that happened to you. I wasn't on the set that day. What? You know, right. you hear stuff that's so fun. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I don't know how to directly answer your question other than uh, I interact more with my B5 family, but... I, I love my Deep Space Nine family too. And and I feel embraced by them, even though, you know, I wasn't one of you guys. I was I was one of you guys in a way. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a, a cast member, but I was a crew member and that counts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you well, saved them a lot of bumps and bruises. Too. I tried. I did my best. <laughs> no, no, I was so handy though. Oh my God. The day Tim Russ hit me, I was so glad he did. Because it completely justified my my being there. Because Nana looks so good mm -hmm. doing a fight, being a dancer, she's like fierce. Yeah. And then it came, you know. Then then she stepped out because it was on her back. So I step in, 
And Tim stepped into the punch and full on punched me in the face. And it was great. It's like, oh my God, thank you. Thank you. Now they know why they hired me. Thank you. So uh, a quick question. We only have a couple minutes left here. But uh, when you were talking about uh, conventions, was there somebody that you met at a convention that just really blew you away or that you never would have expected uh, that you would bond with, or maybe somebody that you already knew, but you really strongly bonded with them and you hadn't expected to through the convention circuit? Oh, you asked some really good questions. Those are fun questions. Thank Ciroc you. texted them to me this morning. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ciroc. <laughs> you know, thank that's you. a fun thank question. Um, I, I recently uh, bef- I did a, a convention in Auckland, New Zealand, and I I ended up waiting for my, I was so bitter. I was a real cranky pot. I arrived and they were going to make me wait seven (laughs) hours before my room was ready. And I just traveled for 20 hours, right? So I'm pissed. Uh, But I'm like, okay, what are you fucking going to do? And the New Zealanders are the nicest people on the planet. So you can't be mad at them. So I go over to the coffee bar. They go, okay, I'll have my 17th cup of coffee. And Ruthie Connell is there. Ruthie's this beautiful little redhead. She's a petite person, but she's just stunning. And I'm five, nine, I'm a Hulk, you know, (laughs) and, and, uh, but I could tell she was somebody, I knew she was there for the convention and I'm kind of too grumpy to start the conversation. She's, she's like, Oh, hello. It turns out she's Scottish. So she has that very sexy accent, you know, and I'm like falling in love with this beautiful little woman. And, um, she was on supernatural. She plays the Mm -hmm. queen of hell and supernatural. I, I haven't seen the show that recently. And uh, we, she's, a, um, she's fascinated with life coaching. We start talking all this personal growth stuff. We, we became like sisters that weekend. And I, I mean, a li- she's just amazing and so random, you know, very, very random. Um, and there's been people that I really wanted to, to kind of get to know and I get excited about meeting. Have you ever had that where you're, there's a star there and you're like, oh, I want to, I can't, oh my God, I want to want to be so bad and I'm so embarrassed to ask for it, you know? I totally nerd out that way. Oh yeah. God. I got my picture taken with John Barrowman. I mean, I mm. jumped the line in front of the fans <laughs> and, and pissed them <laughs> all off. And, and I asked John Barrowman to grab my ass and I've got this picture of him and I grabbing each other's ass and going, oh, it was just so fun. He's from the fans who don't know. He's from the Doctor Who and Torchwood series. Um, just a really fun guy. Anyway, did, did that answer your question, kind of? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rock, did you ever jump in front of a line? You kind of nodded get, knowingly when she said that. To get a picture that. with somebody, uh, like Mike Tyson, have, maybe. No, I've jumped in front of a line, but no, I I was still stuck on Queen of Hell because my head was coming in my head, so I. I was thinking of something totally different, but um, no, um, jumping in front of a line is, I mean, that's, that's the fun moment. So it's cause they come, they happen naturally. They're spontaneous. It's just like, Hey, and you, you don't really plan it out and say, I'm going to no. cut everybody up. You're kind of walking by and you're like, Oh my God, that's the guy or that's the person. And the moment happens just like, you know, spontaneously. And it's it almost natural and great. So I love those moments. Yeah. And, you can, you got it. Those kinds it. of photos are great. Aren't they fun? I know. I know. Yeah. Well, I think we've uh, just about run out of time here, but uh, we will include everything in the description box below uh, where to get your awesome book and where to see your awesome online stuff and your travel uh, company when things open back up and we can actually travel outside of just traveling of the mind. Right. Yeah, indeed. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Sure. It's great talking um, to you guys. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a really great time. It always feels like we're going, taking a trip down memory lane, right, Sirach, when somebody's talking to us from like 90s Star Trek and the infamous yeah. Dr. Crusher fall down scene into the water. <laughs> uh, it's great. I, I was actually happy to hear that because I never actually heard the the Babylon five side of it, you know, right. We yeah. always had our little conversations and, but you gave us a whole lot of background about, you know, the whole thing and how it or- originated. And yeah, it it's interesting, well. isn't it? It is interesting. It wasn't just like, it wasn't just a rumor or it wasn't just one sided. It, it was actually a real, it was a thing. <laughs> it was a real thing. <laughs> it was, it it's was legitimate. A thing. 
Yeah. Seems legit. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, thank you so very much, Patricia Tallman. Uh, it's been great. And we didn't even get to Forrest Gump or Jurassic Park or any I know. of these other things. I mean, like, so I much have stuff. questions about that stuff, but but we're gonna have to do another interview. Yeah, we'll do another one when you have okay. when you're on those topics. Here, let me know. I can pop in. It'd be great. So yeah. much stuff, uh, Sirak. I was looking at her credentials. I was like, oh my goodness, where to start? I know Star Trek. <laughs> 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 but yeah, we we we'd love to have you back, of course, as Sirak oh, says, pleasure. because you're tons of fun and you've done everything. Um, <laughs> one of the benefits really. from being around for decades you know you get, a, get some track tracks in there great so thank you very much everybody who's watching make sure to check out the description box below for all the information mm. the pertinent yeah. information and uh thank you again patricia very very okay. much it's been a great time and everybody at home always remember the seventh rule